Hello there. I'm back with another lecture. Um, this one will basically continue uh, from this lecture on the Enlightenment and the origins of sociological theory. Um, and we will look at two thinkers here, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, pictured here, and uh, Harriet Martineau. Um, de Tocqueville being French, Martineau being English. But uh, the thing that they have com in common is they both traveled to the United States in, you know, roughly the late 1830s or 18, uh, early 1840s and um, developed ideas that are uh, and observations about American society that have been important and influential in the development of sociology and sociological thought. Um, they are kind of represent a continuation of what we had looked about, uh, looked at in the earlier lecture with regard to the age of enlightenment. So remember of all of the various uh, social, political and intellectual factors that gave rise to sociology and sociological theory, the age of enlightenment was the sort of intellectual atmosphere that defined the late 18th and early 19th centuries um, in the context of you know, the industrial revolution in England and uh, the political revolutions in uh, France and the United States uh, and um, the, you know, as well as the slave revolt in, in uh, Haiti. And so within this sort of context, the Age of Enlightenment refers to kind of like this intellectual movement that had popularized uh, the scientific revolution uh, the idea that, you know, we should utilize scientific methods rather than depending on religious orthodoxy. And the Enlightenment had sort of extended those uh, insights from the scientific revolution to say that we should uh, reorganize society in uh, light of this scientific uh, understanding of the world. Um, in a way that, you know, does, you know, that, that sort of does away with the old prejudices and uh, traditions of the old world and, you know, creates a new kind of society based on reason, democracy, and science. And so the Enlightenment sort of had connected um, a, a scientific approach with a kind of liberal humanist worldview, which basically suggested that, you know, the more we adhered to these principles of science and reason, the more it would create a better kind of society, a more democratic society, a society with more uh, individual freedom, um, and a society that could be, you know, sort of more skeptical of uh, orthodoxies and various kinds of, of tyrannies that had defined the old world. So that's where sort of Martineau and de Tocqueville come in, in terms of their analysis of the United States, because these are our European thinkers, de Tocqueville and Martineau, who come to the United States specifically because they want to see to what extent America is putting into practice these kinds of enlightenment um, uh, ideals of democracy and reason and uh, individual freedom. Um, we will see that, you know, de Tocqueville writes this two volume work called Democracy in America, in which he basically tries to understand to what extent the Americans are putting into practice these uh, ideals that have arisen out of the age of enlightenment and uh, you know, blossomed with the French revolution and 
the uh, as well as you know like the Declaration of Independence in America, which suggests that you know all men are created equal, and all of this uh, all of this sort of idealism that had come about in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Martineau will take a similar uh, kind of approach during this same, uh, roughly same period of time. Um, although her conclusions about the United States will be much more um, uh, measured and, and skeptical as to to what extent America has really realized these ideals. So um, that's kind of where the, the context for where um, we, how we need to be thinking about these people and their contributions. De Tocqueville um, had been raised in this very, you know, privileged uh, French aristocratic family um, who, uh, whose power, whose class power was very much under threat from the French Revolution. Remember that the French Revolution had been this upsurge of uh, democracy and equality among the popular masses in France. And it had been directed against the ruling class at that time, which was the aristocracy, the, you know, the king and the queen and uh, the princes and princesses and the whole you know, uh, layer of inherited class power that had ruled France um, you know, for hundreds of years. And so his family was sort of, you know, uh, had barely ex escaped execution, as it says here during the revolution. Um, they, you know, uh, de Tocqueville kind of had, em as we will see, embraced these ideals of democracy, but also had part of him that was um, you know, skeptical, or, you know, we might even say like kind of afraid because of the, uh, of, you know, of like too much democracy he was afraid of because of the experience that his uh, family and people in his class had experienced, you know, basically getting their heads cut off um, during the French Revolution. So he, he comes to the United States, uh, like I said, with this intent to study, you know, American society and American democracy, and to see to what extent like this experiment in democracy was working uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, he had seen how things had gone in France and, you know, similar to someone like Auguste Comte, you know, he, he was kind of ambivalent about de uh, a democracy as it was working itself out in France and wanted to see to what extent the United States, you know, might be might be working better in this regard. So he comes to America in 1831 um, with a colleague, Gustave de Beaumont. Um, they are initially, you know, kind of like they're they're going to study like the prison system um, in America. Um, but you know, de Tocqueville uses this as a kind of an opportunity to travel and talk to people and to kind of assess in a more broader general way, the state of democracy in America. And so he you know, comes back to France and, and writes these, this two volume work. Um, I think the first one comes out in 1835 and the second volume comes out in 1840. And they're you know, based on his, his experiences and observations. And to this day, um, democracy in America is, is a highly influential work, um, not just in sociology, but especially in political science, where it's considered to be um, a real kind of landmark work in terms of theorizing uh, liberalism uh, or, you know, theorizing American liberal democracy. And uh, for sociology, it's more that de Tocqueville um, engages a lot of the questions that People like Durkheim will take up more rigorously, um, you know, a few decades later, and questions also that Auguste Comte um, had raised uh, a little bit earlier than de Tocqueville. And these are questions about like how societies function, and especially about this relationship between 
uh, individuality or, or individualism and um, maintaining order. You know, what are the, 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 the sort of the balance between like freedom and order? Um, those are the questions that really engaged uh, Comte, that engaged Tocqueville, um, and that would engage Durkheim, as we'll see later in the, in the semester. Um, because, and these are questions that engaged them um, because of the larger environment that they were you know, surrounded with, which was an environment of tremendous change, of, of political revolution, um, and of new experiments in, you know, democracy and, um, you know, individualism and, and, and freedom in, in society. So uh, the major theme, um, as I've begun to hint here, uh, to Tocqueville's Democracy in America is this, this question of equality in the United States. He starts off by saying that um, the United States, that Americans have a, have a love of uh, equality or a passion for equality. Um, and he compares this to um, the societies in Europe that at his time are defined by this uh, more rigid class system. Um, in which the aristocracy, you know, had sat at the top of the hierarchy for generations. Um, and, you know, this sort of system where people kind of just inherited their power, they didn't have to do anything to, to earn it, uh, you know, to achieve it. It was something that was inherited from birth, you know, your, your rank, your, your title, um, the, the kind of uh, land estate that you inherited, um, all of this was just kind of passed down from generation to generation uh, without, um, you know, it needing to be like earned or, or um, without it being based on any sort of merit. And um, the way that Tocqueville sort of contrasts this with the United States is to say, well, you know, first of all, America never had that aristocracy. It's a much newer country, um, at least from a sort of European perspective or, you know, relative to these European societies where the uh, aristocratic class power was much more entrenched. And he says, you know, basically like that, that America is defined by um, equality or this, what he says is a passion for equality that's based on, you know, the free mobility of individuals um, that people can, you know, uh, fail or succeed based on their uh, merit, based on, you know, their efforts, their achievements, rather than something that is based on, you know, the family that they were born into, their, their family of origin. And um, he meant also when he talked about the American passion for equality, he meant it in a, in a political sense of like an extension of voting rights, you know, from uh, just say like a property owning elite as it had been um, in Europe. Um, to the more sort of broad masses. This was something that was occurring in, in the 1830s in the United States in the, in the period known as Jacksonian democracy, where you have this um, spread of uh, the vote um, to people who, you know, were not necessarily wealthy and, uh, or, or even owned land. Um, in a way that was considered at the time to be, you know, very um, like groundbreaking that, that basically like America was ahead of the European societies in terms of granting the uh, vote to, you know, um, white men who at least were not as, you know, they didn't have to be to be rich in order to vote. Now I say all this with a sense that, and I'm, you know, I, I don't think if anybody could kind of pick up on this from our perspective now, that this penchant for equality or this passion for equality has some real limitations in terms of like 
racial and, and gender hierarchies in the United States. Um, and that we'll see that, you know, there are, uh, <laughs> there are some real blind spots that De Tocqueville has. So one of the challenges for me here is to kind of like to try to present De Tocqueville's ideas, you know, as, um, as fairly as I can. Um, but also with the sense that, you know, of, of needing to point out, you know, the real limitations in terms of how he's, you know, conceptualizing equality and democracy and, and his, you know, what will be a kind of a, a blindness, um, I think, to other sorts of hierarchies and inequalities that were very much in, entrenched in the United States particularly as it concerns uh, the enslavement of uh, Black people and of the uh, dispossession um, and, you know, genocidal extermination of Native American peoples, of, of Indigenous peoples. So the key question, um, though, that uh, de Tocqueville raises uh, as we begin to sort of look into the text is this question of um, equality versus uh, liberty. And the way that he sort of phrases it is, you know, will the American passion for equality threaten the political liberty of individuals and lead to what he calls a tyranny of the majority? This is again, the part where de Tocqueville, you know, kind of like seems to, uh, herald or praise democracy, but like not too much democracy. <laughs> He's like afraid of like, you know, this, this thing of the, the tyranny of the majority would be like, you know, something that could, could threaten uh, the existence of say a minority ruling class um, who is, you know, um, trying to, in his, as he would put it, like exercise their political liberty, but as we might put it, or, you know, as someone like Marx might put it, um, their political liberty is, is or their, their liberty in general is, is all tied up in their, uh, like their economic self-interest, their material self-interest. So, um, De Tocqueville basically believed that greater equality made Americans more individualistic and more selfish. Um, and so if they are busy competing in business, the question then comes to arise, who will manage the affairs of the larger community? We will see that this is exactly the kind of question that Durkheim is, is wrestling with how can you have a society with more individual liberty and yet also maintain social order at the same time? What's to prevent a society of individual liberty from descending into a kind of chaos or you know, just a kind of a, a Darwinian competitiveness where everybody's just looking out for themselves and nobody care and you know nobody thinks about like social responsibility or you know thinks about their their neighbor or their community and he Tocqueville believed that uh, and this was the part of him that praised American democracy because he believed that America had found uh, a kind of a solution to this individual versus social order uh, question and it had found a solution in the form of decentralized, locally autonomous political institutions. Um, what he will sometimes call, you know, associations or, you know, um, you know basically like, or uh, sometimes he will refer to them as voluntary associations, but just kind of like forms of um, community and participation at a local level that keep, that keep people engaged. And for him, the key part of it was that they connect individual self-interest with a public spirit for the common good, right? So that, that it's, you know, it somehow gives us a kind of a, a happy balance between the two. 
And um, as you know, many um, you know libertarians and uh, you know more sort of like uh, libertarian conservatives continue to argue to this day. He believed that like a weak federal government was something that was actually a, a strength of American democracy. The fact that, you know, at, at least in this period before the Civil War, the federal government of the United States was relatively weak and there was more power given to um, the states and to local municipalities. He believed that that was actually a good thing again, because he believed that that small local institutions counterbalanced this central government. And, uh, you know, he associated, again, as conservative libertarians do to this day, um, that uh, the bigger the government, the more likely it is to become tyrannical, you know, a, a force of tyranny. Um, and the thing that you know he believed really was like the, the the glue holding society together were these like civic and religious associations right these things that kind of like mediate these these forms of association that mediate between uh, the individual and the you know the state the government um these kind of local more decentralized institutions and in the case of like civic and religious associations, um, these were forms of um, instilling people with discipline, uh, with a sense of moral order, um, with belief in the law. Again, when we look at Durkheim in a few weeks, we'll see that this is also something that he puts a lot of value on, especially uh, religion as a form of um, community or as, as a form of, of social cement, you know, something that holds the society together and um, prevents, you know, things from descending into uh, chaos and disorder. So for de Tocqueville, the foundation of American society, of, of, of American democracy, are these civic associations, these voluntary associations, uh, these voluntary organizations that promote a collective good, especially in local communities. In your reading, you can kind of um, see where he begins to talk about these sorts of things, um, particularly around page uh, 107 where um it's you know it's headed uh that the americans combat the effect uh, the effects of individual uh, of individualism by free institutions so this, again this idea that like the excesses of individualism are are reined in by these free institutions um and then i think especially um in the section uh, that's titled, uh, starting on page 110, uh, of the use which the Americans make of public associations in civil life. And that begins on uh, page 110. And you see like at the, at the, at the bottom of uh, page 110, he, he's talking about what he means by these associations. He says, um, Americans of all ages, all conditions, and all dispositions constantly form associations. They have not only commercial and manufacturing companies in which all take part, but associations of a thousand different kinds, religious, moral, serious, feudal, uh, extensive or restricted, enormous or diminutive, the Americans make associations to give entertainments, to found establishments for education, to hold, to build inns, to construct churches, to fuse books, to send missionaries to the antipodes. And in this manner, they found hospitals, prisons, and schools. So these are the ways in which like 
they he imagines that these institutions will promote a kind of collective good and you know limit the amount of like extreme individualism you know that will allow people to be free but also you know participating in their local community he says a little bit above the passage i just read he says on um uh page 110 uh, also but in the in the previous sections uh, in the previous section he says the free institutions which the inhabitants of the united states possess and the political rights of which they make so much use remind every citizen and in a thousand ways that he lives in society right? that that he lives in society that that like we live in a society and we are uh, accountable and responsible um, and interconnected with one another. In other words, that we are not just like these like free floating islands of self-interest who are just, you know, constantly doing what's in our own interest or doing what's good for us. These kinds of associations he believes are really valuable because they remind us that we live in society. And he continues and he says, they, they every instant impress upon his mind the notion that it is the duty as well as the interest of men to make themselves useful to their fellow creatures. And then at the bottom of that paragraph says, men attend to the interests of the public first by necessity, afterward by choice. What was intentional becomes an instinct and by dint of working for the good of one's fellow citizen, citizens, the habit and the taste for serving them is at length acquired. So it's kind of like, he's, I don't know, he's kind of saying like that, that helping uh, one another in society is kind of like this acquired taste that, or a habit at least. And, you know, the more we do it, the more we kind of like choose to do it. Um, and so it's this kind of idea, um, perhaps a fantasy, but, but at, at, at least an idea of like a good society that is where people voluntarily choose to participate um, in these things without being you know, forced to do so, to participate in these kinds of association that you know uh, create you know strong communities that allow people to flourish as individuals. Um, that's at least like what Tocqueville's vision is. Whether the United States has you know has ever had that kind of um, democracy, um, you know, or that level of engagement and participation, uh, I will leave for you to judge for yourselves um but i'll certainly raise some questions here as we go along um he talks then in the next section um and this is like on page like 113 about the role of like the media newspapers uh and the press in uh also facilitating these kinds of the this sort of democracy at a, at a local decentralized kind of level where he says like, you know, that basically like newspapers and the freedom of the press make information cheap and accessible and make it easier for citizens to coordinate their common interests. So you have to remember that like in the 1830s when de Tocqueville comes to America, you know, like mass uh, newspapers that at least were, were accessible to the masses and, you know, and, and could be bought on the streets um, for, you know, relatively cheap price. That was a that was a pretty new thing. Like the newspapers were kind of like, you know, as, as a mass medium of information, you know, that these were that this was like the new, you know, media technology of its time. And um, if you look at, you know, one from pages uh, you know, 113 to 115, you see just kind of like how optimistic he was about 
you know, the value of these, these kinds of, uh, you know, newspaper and, and newspapers and, and freedom of the press. Um, he says kind of uh, it, it, at the very bottom of 113 um, under the, uh, the heading of the relation between public associations and newspapers, he says, newspapers therefore become more necessary in proportion as men become more equal and individualism more to be feared. And he says in the next sentence, he puts it very plainly and just says like, they maintain civilization. Um, and in the last sentence, the evil which they produce is therefore much less than what they cure, right? So it's this kind of idea that, um, you know, these kinds of these forms of media will again kind of reign in like the worst excesses of individualism. Um, so these this are this is kind of the the model of sociological theory and and also um, of political theory that that Dirk, that um, Durkheim will late, later sort of pick up on. Um, and that Tocqueville is asserting here where basically like people um, will freely, if the system is working at its best, it's the idea that people will be freely uh, choosing to engage in these civic associations in order to pursue local goals and that those civil associations were you would be would serve as a kind of an antidote against you know an authoritarian tyrannical state uh, of a of a central government and this was something that you know was was very much being argued um, at the time in the 1830s um, the Jacksonian Democrats the the Democrats that favored Andrew Jackson were always sort of going on about you know the dangers of um, an overreaching federal government, right? Um, now, I, I think Tocqueville leaves out a little bit of the, the context for this because part of what those Jacksonian Democrats were, were worried about was, was a federal government that might you know, reach into their uh, institution of slavery. Um, and uh, so that was, you know, sort of an unstated subtext of what was going on uh, a lot at that time. Um, but the Tocqueville doesn't really uh, address that. So, um, you know, in sum, as, I, as I've said about him, his, his questions about how to balance individualism and social order were, uh, and, you know, in individualism and social responsibility, freedom and order, as it says here, those continue to be crucial questions at the heart of sociological theory for people like Emile Durkheim. Um, basically, like how can we, you know, have an individualistic society without everything descending into chaos and disorder? Uh, and so de Tocqueville believed that American society had you know, American democracy had like figured some things out is basically like what he's saying is that they had created these kind of like local decentralized institutions that kind of like, you know, were, you know, independent of the federal government and that kind of integrated the individual into their local communities um, through these kinds of association and participation. So, you know, in a lot of ways, he, he told a very um, optimistic story that people, especially in America, wanted to believe, you know, this idea that, that the United States was this kind of like exceptional experiment in democracy making um, and that they had, that, that America had avoided some of the excesses that had befallen France after the revolution and that, you know, had fought, befallen other um, countries that had undertaken an experiment in democracy. So he tells this story that, you know, I think 
a lot of um, American liberals sort of love to continue to, to talk about to this day. Um, but it, as I mentioned before, has some enormous blind spots um, for what was going on at the time, which was, of course, first of all, you know, mass uh, enslavement um, and a slave system that was actually getting bigger and, and not fading away, not in decline, um, but that was very much uh, on the rise. And at that time, the United States and, and particularly the federal government was dominated by these slaveholding powers. I mean, that's what that's who was in the White House, but also who was, you know, the head of the military and in charge of foreign policy and in the cabinet and all the levers of power in the United States were really dominated by Southern slaveholders um, at this time and would continue to be basically up until, um, you know, 1860 with the uh, election of Abraham Lincoln and the um, beginning of the Civil War. It also enormously overlooks um, the removal of indigenous peoples at the time and removal being a a true um, euphemism here, um, but one that uh, describes basically a, a process of mass dispossession, um, especially among the, the Cherokee people who uh, were, you know, native to the American South and, you know, rooted in, in Georgia and, and other, um, you know, states in the South that were basically pushed off their land uh, to make room for more slave plantations. Um, and, you know, so all those indigenous people were kind of pushed west um, off their land into, in, in, you know, what was the, uh, you know, known as the Trail of Tears, uh, an absolutely uh, disgusting episode in American history. Um, and, um, you know, one, one again, that when we read uh, de Tocqueville talking about, you know, America's, you know, uh, passion for equality, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of to, to square that. Um, so, I, for example, I'll, I'll take you, if, if you could look back to the reading for a minute, um, there's one passage here where he talks about this, it's on, um, one second, page 109 um, in the middle of the, uh, of the page under the um, heading that the Americans combat the effects of individualism by free institutions. Uh, he starts off the, the paragraph here in the middle of the page by saying, in the United States, the more opulent citizens take great care not to stand aloof from the people. On the contrary, they constantly keep on easy terms with the lower classes. They listen to them. They speak to them every day. They know that the rich in democracies always stand in need of the poor. All right. So what de Tocqueville is you know, saying here is basically like in America, the class system is a lot more fluid and equal than it is in Europe. You know, in Europe, the upper classes would never talk to the poor or to the, the laboring classes or, you know, they, they would never mix with, you know, the common people. And he's saying like, you know, look at America has, you know, those kind. he's saying like in America, those kinds of class boundaries you know don't exist now i'm skeptical of this description to begin with but um it also you know presupposes <laughs> an entire uh erasure of um you know a people of color in in this scenario it amounts to you know what historians call like a, a heron volk democracy which is basically where you can where you can have 
you insist on equality among members of a particular ethnic group that presupposes the exclusion um, and the dehumanization of entire other groups of people. So it's like what de Tocqueville is describing here is a, is a kind of like, you know, white ethno nationalism that might um, cross class boundaries. I'm still kind of skeptical about how true that really is, but even if it were true, the fact of the matter is, is that it's limited to within, uh, you know, white American society. And it sort of presupposes that, you know, all of these other, uh, you know, people of color are like not human <laughs> or like, you know, that equality doesn't like apply to them. You know, Americans passion, he can describe Americans as having a passion for equality um, while overlooking, you know, slavery and Indian removal because uh, it's just kind of assumed that those are not you know, equal, those are not human beings on an equal uh, footing. So it has this deeply entrenched kind of blind spot. Um, I think the question that's also worth raising um, about de Tocqueville is, you know, this question about like civil and political associations about local democratic institutions um, and to what extent those, you know, if they, did once exist, to what extent have those like persisted? Um, has American society simply become just more and more uh, individualistic? Um, uh, you know, what, to what extent are those civil associations, you know, even still kind of viable? Uh, about a couple of decades ago, a political scientist by the name of Robert Putnam wrote this book called Bowling Alone, which was about basically the decline of American bowling leagues. Um, but he used it in this way where the bowling league, the decline of, of bowling leagues was a kind of a metaphor for the decline of all sorts of American uh, civic institutions, you know, voluntary associations of the type that de Tocqueville is describing here. And in fact, Putnam's work was, was very engaged with de Tocqueville in the sense that, you know, Putnam also believed that, that the health of democracy, you know, could be measured by people's participation in, you know, like all of these like things like, you know, the PTA or the, the Girls and Boy Scouts or, you know, local little league or, you know, neighborhood associations. Putnam, like de Tocqueville, believed that those things were essential for the health of democracy, but he believed that basically those things were in the decline, that, you know, like people didn't do those, engage in those kinds of things anymore, or at least not to the same extent that they had. So hence the idea of bowling alone, that like Americans don't really like join bowling leagues in the same way that they did in previous generations, just like they don't join all sorts of different associations. So Putnam's conclusions were, were pretty pessimistic on this front, that basically saying like Americans were just becoming more and more individualistic, more, you know, just kind of looking out for themselves and, and not engaged um, in these kinds of um, local associations in the way that, you know, de Tocqueville had hoped. So, I think that you know there, there's plenty of, of reason to be um, to to engage with the Tocqueville's ideas and at the same well at the same time being critical and 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 skeptical of the conclusions that he reached and of um, of the story that he tells you know is which is something that that a lot of people I think find seductive and or, and want to believe in this sort of story of the exceptionalism of American democracy. Um, but I think, you know, when we sort of pull the curtain back, um, it looks a lot messier. Harriet Martineau is somebody who, you know, could be considered 
um, a sort of a peer of de Tocqueville's um, in a lot of ways it, it, as a sort of an intellectual peer who, you know, uh, was alive at roughly the same time and, and also came to the United States in roughly the same time and with similar kinds of objectives, trying to parse out the extent to which American society was, you know, a, a healthy functioning democracy um, in the way that, you know, uh, de Tocqueville had described. Um, and, um, you know, uh, traveled around the country, wrote her observations, and then wrote a book called Society in America um, based on them. Martineau had grown up in a, in a, in a middle-class family in, in Norwich, uh, England, and uh, a family that was of the Unitarian faith, um, a, uh, a, um, so, so like a, pro a sect of, of Protestantism. And the important part about that is just that the Unitarians really sort of valued education, um, which included education for women. So she, you know, um, is able to sort of uh, pursue her education in, in ways that like, you know, most American women, even um, the ones from the most elite ruling classes would not have been encouraged to, uh, to do um, at that period of time. And she also, you know, had, um, you know, uh, physical circumstances, health circumstances that kind of caused her to focus more of her energy and effort into her education, um, being frequently ill as a child and a condition that caused her to um, lose most of her hearing. And from then, you know, at, from a young age, she then became, you know, really immersed in uh, reading and writing and, and studying um, as, as an, uh, an intellectual. And so we will see that, you know, she had an important role in um, developing sociology as a discipline and contributing to um, sociological theory, um, even anticipating, you know, at least to some limited extent, anticipating some insights that would later arise with feminist theory um, and, you know, the stand, uh, as far as the standpoint of women um, it looking into uh, social institutions and particularly looking into social institutions that were often being ignored or, or overlooked by um, male intellectuals like Alexis de Tocqueville. So um, Martineau in her young age basically like starts off by, um, you know, looking at the, the field of political economy, what, what we would today call um, economics. And uh, this was, you know, where a lot of the most innovative theorizing of the late 18th and early 19th century was coming from, you know, everybody from uh, Adam Smith to David Ricardo to John Stuart Mill. Um, these were, you know, some of the most influential and important thinkers of the day. And so Martineau basically gets her intellectual start by providing these really, you know, sort of concise summaries that are written for, you know, non-specialists or non-experts in the field of political economy. They're, they're written for a more general audience and they become actually, you know, pretty wildly successful. Um, people want, you know, like an accessible summary or an accessible overview of these influential, um, but, you know, often intellectually dense ideas. And so she has a real gift for being able to kind of translate um, Adam Smith and David Ricardo and, and these, these uh, economists' ideas to, into terms that like a more generally educated audience would understand. Uh, and then um, she takes her, uh, you know, uh, takes to the United States, um, which we'll talk a little bit more uh, in depth here in person. Um, but, um, 
you know, co comes to the United States and then writes this book called Society in America that are based on her uh, observations of American society and her extensive travels in the United States. Um, so right roughly around the same time as Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, and so we'll see that she wrestles a little bit more with the questions of, of the time, especially um, with the question of slavery. And then um, in her later work, uh, How to Observe Morals and Manners, um, she kind of, this is probably her most important like theoretical work um, in terms of analyzing what sociologists would later call like norms and values. Um, she looks at, you know, an analysis of, of, you know, what she calls morals and manners but are really kind of like society's ideas, their norms of behavior, and then their um, patterns of action and association, like the, uh, you know, the kind of communities they form and, and the kinds of um, actions that people take. So here there's some overlap with this Hokeville uh, insofar as, you know, they wanna, um, they each wanna theorize the conditions under which people join and participate in uh, associations of all kinds. And, um, and then another important landmark for her in terms of her contribution to sociology is that Martineau is the first person to translate Auguste Comte um, and Auguste Comte's uh, text, Positive Philosophy. Remember that, that, that uh, Comte had presented this law of three stages in which the positive stage was the highest or most scientific stage of, um, you know, of intellectual understanding that was also like connected with a higher stage of, of social reality, uh, you know, a, a higher stage of society, a more rational, democratic and individualistic society. So basically like, Martineau, um, her contribution here is to make Comte's ideas about so, uh, sociology, you know, the idea that there should be this science uh, for the study of society called sociology. She makes those ideas accessible to English readers, you know, readers in the English speaking world uh, in, in Britain and the United States uh, for the first time. And so helps to sort of bring uh, the ideas for sociology out of a out of a French context and into the uh, English speaking world. Martineau was able to do that because she, uh, you know, spoke and read French as well as English. So, um, for her text "Society in America," which we'll look at in, in a little bit uh, in more in depth, in which I gave you an excerpt to to read. Um, Martineau spends, you know, like two years in the U.S. approximately uh, traveling across the country in 1834, 1835, meeting with a variety of uh, different politicians and dignitaries. Um, you know, most of the people she talked to were pretty, were pretty elite, uh, pretty upper class, including as we will, as you see by um, reading the excerpt, that I posted, um, including a lot of slaveholders that, that she talked to. Um, but in contrast to de Tocqueville, she was more um, vocal about uh, the issue of racial equality, about um, uh, the abolition of slavery and the rights of women, um, and uh, also of, um, you know, that, that there should be sort of more equity when it comes to property relations, when it comes to class relations. And, um, you know, again, we'll see that like, she might not have been as, she certainly wasn't as like critical of slavery as some other people in her time, some of the abolitionists of her time. She was more willing to consider it a problem than someone like Alexa de Tocqueville and probably most um, intellectuals of the time who kind of like, you know, ignored or, you know, said like, oh, well, slavery is this 
this kind of unfortunate thing, but it's, you know, it's going to die out or, you know, eventually societies will progress or, you know, they would find different ways to rationalize or excuse it. So Martineau was different from most intellectuals of her time in the sense of um, being, being more willing to put uh, the institution of slavery under the microscope and criticize it. Um, but as we'll see, um, you know, she wasn't in maybe as critical as she could have been. Um, she basically also, you know, criticizes this contradiction between what, you know, like America says it is and um, what its realities are. And, and again, here, I think she's better than de Tocqueville about this. She looks at, you know, kind of like the hypocrisy or, or at least the contradiction between the stated ideal that all men are created equal, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, um, and the realities of uh, slavery, of um, the subjection of women, of a class inequality and political corruption, um, all of those things that, you know, directly contradicted uh, this high-minded ideal um, and the, all the various high-minded ideals that had been the slogans of the American Revolution and, um, you know, were the ideals that American society and American democracy at least, you know, professed to believe. Eventually she did um, befriend an abolitionist, uh, the most prominent abolitionist in the country, William Lloyd Garrison, in the 1830s, um, you know, who was always, you know, sort of being uh, attacked and, and having his uh, newspapers, you know, his printing press, you know, burned or destroyed by um, mobs who didn't like what uh, he had to say against slavery. Um, she eventually becomes friends with this person, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, at an abolitionist meeting uh, in, in Boston, um, where she speaks out. And then after that, she too has her life threatened and her plans to visit the South are cut off. And, and this, you know, changes uh, the whole sort of dynamic of what she's able to do with this text, uh, Society in America. <clears throat> so, um, for her, the, the subject matter of, of sociology should be, again, these, these terms, morals and manners. Uh, and here's where she begins to present a more generalized social theory, um, whereby, you know, when she talks about morals, she means like society's ideas about encouraging certain forms of behavior um, or, you know, forbidding other kinds of behavior. And by manners, she means, you know, these patterns of actions and association. These are similar, uh, as it says here, to what sociologists would later to refer to as norms, values, institutions, and culture. So that there's some overlap with de Tocqueville here. De Tocqueville was interested also, you know, in American values and, and obviously in, in American associations and patterns of association. Um, so taking the microscope, the microscope to looking, you know, not just at like, um, you know, the, the, the big political events of the time, but also looking at like the day-to-day -day behaviors, the forms of social interaction, the forms of routine, the norms of society, um, because they believed that these were the, the, these were kind of the glue that um, cements the social order. And, um, you know, in a way that kind of anticipates some of the insights of, of feminist theory, you know, in the, in the 20th century, she would say that the validity and truth value of society, sociology depends on three interconnected practices, impartiality, critique, and sympathy. So that sociological observers must produce fair and accurate descriptions of the societies they observe but also critically assess its moral status and maintain sympathy for its inhabitants. So 
this will be a, um, an ongoing concern with sociological theory as well. That on the one hand, you know, we want to provide, you know, scientifically objective um, descriptions of uh, the societies that we study and the and the forms of uh, you know interaction and association that we study. You know, we want those to be you know fair and accurate and and at least as unbiased as we can make them. Um, but on the other hand, also to you know, critically assess uh, the moral status of society and to maintain sympathy for the, in, uh, the inhabitants of society. So many sociologists have since wrestled with this question of how to maintain this balance, how to kind of like, you know, for some people like walking a tightrope between you know, being uh, fair and objective and um, maintaining a, um, a, you know, a balanced perspective, uh, while at the same time, you know, sympathizing with the people in society, particularly like people who are being oppressed within the society. And so uh, Martineau, you know, uh, because her sympathies are more with the oppressed and the downtrodden in society, um, she will be inclined to sort of write more from their perspective. So her um, methodology was basically to seek, she calls like um, objectifications or, or things um, that represent the manners and morals of society. So that you know you you don't just like go and and talk to people, but also you know go and study the things that it produces. Um, that you know where society basically is telling a story about itself. You know, in its monuments, for example, um, in its artworks. You know, for example, those things that embody or represent the common mind, the voice of the people, the condition of the masses, you know? So it's, it's, it's music, it's, it's literature, um, it's art, but also, you know, it's more kind of like commonplace kinds of things. It's, you know, it's domestic I interiors, you know, like how people, arrange their living rooms and their and their housing. Um, these were the kinds of uh, like what Durkheim would call social facts that we can sort of put under the microscope and analyze um, in terms of what they tell us about society uh, beyond what like the inhabitants of that society, you know, tell us. Uh, as sociologists, the, the objects, the things, the artifacts also speak volumes uh, and we must uh, study them um, and, and, and not just like, you know, take what, take for granted what people themselves have to say. So for Martineau, sociology is a kind of critical science and it has this ethical imperative to oppose domination. Um, this was not something that, you know, um, like Auguste Comte or some of the other founders of sociology thought. Um, it's certainly, I don't think was something that Alexis de Tocqueville thought, but we will see that it, um, this idea that sociology has an ethical Im uh, imperative to oppose domination is something that you know, since Martineau's time has been um, an important, although controversial uh, influence within the discipline, right? That, um, and, you know, this will certainly continue into 20th century forms of sociology and especially with, you know, feminist theory um, and critical race theory and, and all kinds of different sociological theories that, uh, you know, explicitly develop ideas with the notion that they can be useful in opposing domination. And 
develop their theories on the basis of taking the perspective, taking a sympathetic perspective towards those who are being dominated in society. In her study of American society, Martineau basically singled out these four major practices of domination. Again, she emphasizes slavery, she emphasizes the treatment of women, um, and then also, you know, what de Tocqueville would probably would have called like the tyranny of the majority, um, the, you know, the, the subservience to public opinion, you know, meaning uh, a kind of, you know, Tocqueville would have seen it as like the danger of like a mob mentality kind of taking over in America where um, people just kind of conform to public opinion you know, there a, a kind of sheepishness um, on the part of people. And then finally, she talked uh, also about like the fetishism of wealth and the way in which, although America professed to be this equal democratic society, it was also very obviously, um, even in those days, oriented towards the pursuit of material wealth. Um, I just want to take a look at the uh, reading um, from Martineau on society in America, uh, just to point out some, um, some passages and give you an overview of sort of what she has to say. Again, they kind of introduce her, her at the top and talk about, you know, her opposition to racial and gender inequality and, and her attempts you know, to create sociology as this kind of um, ethical but scientific discipline. And, um, you know, so she, in this, in this excerpt, it's about six or seven pages long, sort of, you know, talks about the, the sort of the methods, you know, that she used in, in terms of observation and, and traveling in the United States and, um, you know, what she was, uh, how she was trying to sort of, you know, understand American society um, and the different, you know, like institutions that she visited. She talks about the prisons that she visited, the hospitals that she visited, uh, the literary and scientific institutions, factories, plantations, farms, and so forth. So it's a you know, pretty compelling, um, you know, what today people would call like a, a methodology uh, section, you know, like a method section where you basically talk about like the field work that you did and how you did it. And you want to, you know, try to do as she does here to emphasize like kind of the range of different people and different locations and different institutions that you have, um, you know, taken into consideration in your analysis. So then um, she talks about what she calls the, the morals of slavery, which she, the first thing she says about this is, you know, this is not written in a spirit of mockery, the morals of slavery. In other words, sounds, um, you know, oxymoronic, uh, like how could there be anything moral about slavery? Um, and then, you know, sort of talks about, uh, you know, when we contrast slavery with the principles and the rule, which are the test of American institutions, the principles that all men are born free and equal, that rulers derive their just powers from the consent of the govern and the rule of reciprocal justice, then basically like, you know, th there's an obvious contradiction, she says here, like this discrepancy between principles and practice needs no more words. Like there's just an obvious glaring contradiction in America between, you know, its professed morality and its reality, um, which is, you know, which has slavery at the core of it. And then she says, well, you know, so this institution of slavery exists and what we have to see is what the morals are of the society which is subjected to it. So again, when she's saying morals, she's meaning like more like the values or the ideas 
that are used to kind of legitimate it. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I get a little like, I remember reading this for the first time where she says like, nothing struck me more than the patience of slave owners. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, um, you know, that, that, that does not sound, that doesn't sound, doesn't sound right at all. Um, and then, you know, goes through and, and sort of describes this situation of, uh, of slavery in the South in a way that to me, you know, is, is kind of cringy. Like I said in the earlier, like she may have eventually become an abolitionist um, and professed her opposition to slavery, but here she looks pretty apologetic, sounds pretty apologetic to it. Um, where she's talking about like you know, the mercy, the, uh, the patience um, that slaveholders uh, exhibit towards their slaves, says like, you know, um, people from New England, France or England, uh, you know, would become more severe masters and mistresses. Uh, but in the South, <laughs> she's suggesting, I think that like, you know, the slaveholders were somehow nicer. Uh, there's not, um, this I think goes to show maybe some of the limitations of who um, she had been talking to in her observations. But then it does get a little bit more critical uh, as she kind of goes along. Um, you know, like here when she says like you know I was heart sick of being told of the ingratitude of slaves and wary that of explaining that indulgence can never atone for injury that the extremist pampering for a lifetime is no equivalent for rights withheld no reparation for irreparable injustice what are the greatest possible amounts of finery sweetness dances gratitudes and kind words and looks in exchange for political, social, and domestic existence. So it's kind of like she's sitting around in the South listening to all these slaveholders going on and on about like how their slaves aren't like, don't have enough gratitude. Um, and then is like, you know, saying back to them like, well, you know, you might want to think about like the, you know, the rights to existence that, that you've denied them. And like, you know, the, I, I think that's the, a very euphemistic way that she puts it. Um, but, you know, says here, like, I, a common question put to me by amiable ladies was, do you not find the slaves generally very happy? And they never seem to have been asked or have asked themselves the question with which I replied, would you be happy with their means? So what she's saying is basically like, you know, she's talking to these like, you know, these wealthy elite slaveholders and they're like, don't you think our slaves are really happy? I mean, don't they seem happy to you? And she's like, um, would you be happy if you were in their situation? And it kind of like takes these slaveholders aback, like they had never been asked that question. They never seemed to have been asked that or thought about it. So I think that, you know, it, it, you've got to sort of remember the, the, the context to hear. She's moving in uh, very gently or very subtly into a kind of a critique of, of slavery. Um, but, uh, you know, again, one, as I said, that there's, you know, other people were making at the time in, in more direct kind of ways or people had, you know, really started making. Um, in the rest of this text, you notice that, you know, she talks about slavery really from the standpoint of, of morality and, um, and also it, like it's, it's uh, consequences for the family. And this is, you know, again, something you kind of have to contextualize with the knowledge that like, 
how um, when people talked about the amorality of slavery, the, the, just how immoral it was um, at that time, they often talked about it, it's, uh, about its degrading effect on families because families had been put on a pedestal you know, as the sort of moral sanctum of society. And so if something was bad for the family, it was, it was therefore bad for society. And so a lot of the anti-slavery literature of this time um, emphasized like how bad slavery was for, you know, the family form. And, and you see that in, you know, like the best-selling novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin by uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, is one among many texts um, of that, you know, like abolitionist texts of that time that take this kind of this kind of angle. So that's just a little bit sort of to contextualize that. Um, and then, you know, she goes into then like the status of of women in American society, again, with an emphasis on like the the hypocrisies and the contradictions of American society, you know, where she says, you know, if a, if a test of civilization be sought, none can be so sure as the condition of that half of society over which the other half has power. From the exercise of the right of the strongest, tried by this test, the American civilization appears to be of a lower order than might have been expected from some other symptoms of its social state. The Americans have in the treatment of women fallen below not only their own democratic principles, but the practices of some parts of the old world. So she says like, basically like, you know, uh, a lot of people say that, you know, if you wanna know how civilized a society is, look at the way that it treats its women, All right? Um, and if you use that as your yardstick, um, then American society is not nearly as advanced uh, as the societies in um, Europe, uh, that it doesn't live up to its, you know, statement of equality, its, its supposed passion for equality. It doesn't live up to its ideals of democracy. And in some cases, it hasn't even like caught up to, you know, what's going on in Europe. I mean, remember, this is a this is a highly educated woman who had been, you know, encouraged to, uh, you know, undertake her educational studies. And, and when she looks at similar um, uh, kinds of American women in, in similar kinds of class positions, she finds that their um, levels of education and, and also just their general social treatment is, is really lacking. So she, you know, sort of like talks about this, about, um, you know, the way that like women are uh, treated and um, she talks about the, sort of the disjunction between, uh, sh you know, the kind of chivalry and then um, the inequality of, uh, you know, the, the, the real kinds of gender inequalities in the society where she says, um, while women's intellects uh, women's intellect is confined, her morals crushed, her health ruined. Um, he uh, weaknesses encourage her weaknesses encouraged. I think it should say, and her strength punished. She is told that her lot is cast in the paradise of women, and there is no country in the world where there is so much boasting of the chivalrous. Uh, treatment she enjoys. That is to say, she has the best place in stagecoaches, where there are not enough for everybody, the gentlemen stand. She hears oratorial, uh, oratorical flourishes on public occasions about wives and home and apostrophes to woman. Her husband's hair stands at the, on the end of, her, <laughs> of the idea of her working, and he toils to indulge her with money. So all these ways in which like, you know, there's this supposedly like chivalrous behavior in which women are being told like, oh, you have it so good here. You know, you'll never have to work. Your husband will take care of you. You know, if you, if, you know, 
there isn't a seat on the stage coach. You'll get to sit there and a man will have to stand up. <laughs> but like, you know, uh, as she says here, this is kind of like little compensation for, you know, the earlier sentence, which describes a much more crushing form of oppression. Woman's intellect is confined, her morals crushed, her health ruined, her weaknesses encouraged, her strength punished. Right? Um, as she puts it here, in short, indulgence is given her as a substitute for justice. Right? So this chivalry is, you know, some sort of symbolic compensation that, you know, on the surface seems like it's, you know, being nice to women and, you know, seems like it's putting women on a pedestal or, um, you know, that, that, it's, that it's doing women a favor and they should be so grateful that they live in such a great country. Um, but in reality, what it is, is, is perpetuating uh, hierarchy and inequality that ultimately dehumanizes uh, and destroys women's lives. Um, so she talks about, you know, sort of like compares this in, in terms of um, the slave system and, and um, you know, the, just the sort of the, the condition and the, the unfreedom of women in the society. She says, you know, it's not comparable to what slaves endure, but, you know, it's also, um, women are also not free in America. So, you know, th this uh, sort of treatise here goes on to talk about, you know, the status of women, the crushing of uh, women's morals. Again, like this, this discourse of, of morals is, is so central to um, Martineau. And this is something that'll kind of be picked up when um, we look at uh, Emile Durkheim, especially, um, because he's especially concerned with these issues of, of uh, like norms and, and morality. Okay, that should uh, do it for today. And uh, hope that that was useful. Thanks, bye.